Philippians chapter number 4 and uh, verse number 17. The Bible said, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we've opened your Bible and we're asking you now to speak to our hearts. We recognize, Lord, we're not worthy to even have a Bible. And Father, we are so glad to be accepted in the Beloved because you've provided a way for us. Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for your grace. Help us, Lord, to put all of our inhibitions and all of our unbelief and all of our cares of this world and worries aside. And help us to now to open our hearts and receive with meekness the engrafted word. This word that's able to save our souls is able to sanctify us and change us. I pray, Lord, for those discouraged that you'd encourage their hearts today. Father, lead us and guide us through your word. And we pray again that we be helped, that you get the glory. And Father, as we close and give an invitation for salvation, if there be one that needs to trust Christ as Savior and Lord, I pray that would happen this day. We give you all the glory for it now. Again, I pray the devil would be far from this place as we preach. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last time we were in Philippians, which was two Sundays ago, and let me just throw just a very quick closer on last week. Uh, Brother Baxter did a, a tremendous job. The messages that he brought, especially in the evening when he got really practical, went through all the different things you can do to protect your home, uh, really spoke to my heart. Uh, and basically what it boiled down to is this. If you have streaming services and you can, you can get VidAngel, I think it's like $8 a month, it will literally filter anything that comes into your house and keep the filth away from your eyes, your ears, and the eyes and ears of your children. And then also, Covenant Eyes is a wonderful thing to put on your devices because it gives you an accountability partner that will watch and see what is on your devices and help you. If you have a pornography problem, that can help you with that. And uh, then he also did a thing called Bark, which uh, makes your home internet unable to even get anything into your house. So if somebody comes and says, can I come up to the internet? No matter what's on their phone, they can't even get to stuff because you're completely blocking it at the point of entry. I thought it was worth its weight in gold, what Brother Baxter did. And we have taken it to heart because I love my wife. I love my Savior. And I don't want to stand up here and be a hypocrite. I don't want to live my life as a hypocrite. I want to have a pure heart and a pure mind. And if you desire that, now you say, well, I've heard all that preach. I'm just not sure what I ought to do. Maybe you need some counsel. Maybe we can sit down and talk about it, and I can just point you in the right direction and try to help you to get some of that set up. If you're interested, I want you to know I'm here. But, uh, so we missed last Sunday, and uh, but two Sundays ago, we examined verses 8 through 16 in Philippians 4, uh, which is an awesome, awesome passage, of course, because it holds Philippians 4.13, amen? And uh, so in verse 8, you remember, though, uh, we are instructed on what to think on, and if you forget that, you can go to the bathroom, amen? And right there in the bathroom on the wall, just right there by the napkins, you can remember because the scripture, Philippians 4.8, is right there on the wall. Now, we did that purposefully because most battles that we are facing in our life, they begin in our mind. And these are battles that we make decisions, wrong decisions to sin, and then those things come out. And so if we think right, it's really going to help us. And so if it was, the Bible said, if it's true, if it's honest, if it's just, if it's pure, if it's lovely, if it's of good report, if it's virtuous and praiseworthy, this is the recipe for inward holiness, and this is what should fill our minds. And so we looked at what to think on, and I pray that we'll continue throughout our life. And by the way, when you put that in there, and then your eyes want to wander to something that's not in those categories, we've given the Holy Spirit now the tool, which is the sword of the Spirit through the Scripture that we have looked at, believed in, and now He can convict us. Stop looking at that. Stop thinking on those things. Stop meditating. Stop being depressed and believing the devil's lies. And so this is one of the reasons 
that this is so important to put these scriptures in. I then shared an awesome piece of wisdom that, again, is not original with me, uh, but I think it's worth resharing. And I hope you'll remember this. This was a life-changing piece of uh, information when I first received it. And it goes like this. If you plant a thought, you will reap an action. And so what you do is directly related to the thoughts you allow into your brain. You plant an action, you're going to reap a habit. You plant a habit, you're going to reap a lifestyle. And if you plant a lifestyle, you'll reap a destiny. But the beginning of that road is making a decision. This mind is for the glory of God. And I'm not just going to fake it on the outside. I'm going to fill this mind with the things that are pleasing to my Savior and glorious uh, in God's sight. Amen? And so this statement, I believe it will be more mean more to you as you grow older and as you see it played out in people's lives, including your own. We then discussed how appreciative that Paul was for the missions mindedness of the church in Philippi. They loved missions and they loved the Apostle Paul and uh, not just in words, but they loved him in deeds as well. They held the ropes and supported these men. And I'm going to tell you, it's very important that we do that. And when we get to the point as a church where we're sending men out to start New Testament Baptist churches, we're not just shooting them out of a cannon. I was telling the men last night, all that our home church does for us as a missionary arm extended down here to start this church. And they do a lot. They hold the ropes for us. They are a biblical church. If I needed my preacher right now, if I was in a bind, whether it be spiritually, I need prayer, I need counsel, I need him to be here, I need him to cover the pulpit. If a disaster happened, it was a financial crunch. If I needed my church, they would be here. And I want you to understand, Philippi was like that to Paul. And we're going to see a lot more of that today. But finally, we parked on the great Philippians 4.13. Amen. Now, I know all scripture is great. I 100% agree with the thoughts going through your brain. All of it's inspired. All of it is quick and powerful and all of that. But there just are some scriptures like John 3.16, like Romans 10.13, like Philippians 4.13. It's like if you had a Mount Everest of New Testament verses, you know, you'd have about four or five of them on there. And Philippians 4.13 just seems to be in that category. Now, I don't want to do this. I don't want to open the whole Pandora's box rabbit trail today of going through everything uh, that is encompassed in Philippians 4.13. But I want to remind you of some things we said. Sadly, it's a verse that is almost consistently, it consistently isolated from both the chapter and the entire letter in which it exists. It exists in a context, and so we want to bring that out here again in just a moment. But preachers and teachers consistently misinterpret Philippians 4.13. They misapply this verse to everything under the sun except for what it actually applies to in the context, all right? So like if you say, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, I think I know what you mean, but I'm going to tell you the Bible means something that may be different, all right? And then this verse is often relegated to nothing more than a cool slogan. And I like Tim Tebow. By the way, if you don't at least like Tim Tebow, there's probably something wrong with you, right? I mean, yeah, Brother Tim's a little bit more liberal of a Christian, and he does some things we don't necessarily agree with. But at, at heart, I mean, when you hear the guy, when you hear his testimony, when you know his parents are missionaries, when you know he's helping orphans and helping uh, to try to keep people from getting sex trafficked and all of that, I say that to say Tim Tebow's good people, okay? He may not agree with us 100%, but you remember when he played for the Florida Gators? And he had Philippians 4.13 on his eye uh, color there. He put that in. And, and we see it. We see it. And I'm not, again, being very overly critical about that. But we see it. You know, entertainers display it. It's on banners. And people just want to throw it out and use it as kind of an umbrella over everything. But what we mentioned extensively, uh, we mentioned what this verse does not mean. We said that it doesn't mean, I'm just going to give you a couple of them, that if you attend church, you're going to win all your football games. Amen. That's not what Philippians 4.13 means. I can do all things through Christ. Certainly that's all about football. It doesn't mean, and I know nobody in here is crazy. A couple of you I've got my doubts about, but no, just kidding. But uh, it doesn't mean you go jump off a cliff because you can do all things through Christ which strengthens you. Remember not to tempt the Lord your God. Amen. And so it doesn't mean that. But we said what verse 13 does mean that Paul could be in a variety of different situations, including poverty and wealth. Verse number 11, it means Paul could abound, he could be abased, he could be full, he could be hungry, he could suffer need. Why? Because Christ was giving him the strength to do so. He said that he could deal with any situation because he could do all those things through Christ 
which strengtheneth him. So it's not necessarily about you winning football games or doing crazy things like jumping off a cliff. I can do all things. I'm going to walk out in front of traffic and just prove God. It doesn't mean that. It means no matter where you go in your life and what you face, no matter how the devil is breathing down your neck trying to destroy your relationships, destroy your life, if you will trust in Christ, you can make it through those situations. He will give you the strength. You can do all things through Christ because he'll strengthen you in every single situation. Right. And I said it this way. I restated it uh, kind of with the understanding at him. I'm not writing my own version of the Bible in case you wonder that. I heard of a preacher recently that was thinking about doing that. But anyway, I, in fact, I heard of a couple of them. I don't think we need a new Bible. I think we need to start obeying the old one. Amen. Amen. You know, somebody said, well, we need a new King James. I mean, you don't obey the old one yet. Amen. And so no, I'm not into that. But I'm telling you, this is the, this is the verse with understanding if you'll hear it. It means this, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, no matter how much I have to suffer for Him. This is Paul's context, okay? As I serve Him in good times and in bad times, Christ has taught me to be content and to trust that what He has called me to do, no matter how difficult it is, He will strengthen me for the tasks He has laid upon my heart and life. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen? And so, again, we could re-preach that. It's a glorious verse, but we do need to move on. Notice verse 17 with me. Now we'll begin by reading verse 17, then we're going to expound it. Paul said, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now I want to look at this as we move forward in the passage, but in order to gather the context of this portion of Scripture, I want to go back and read verse 14 through 17, and you'll notice this is about the church at Philippi helping Paul. Now you remember, Paul went there, no promise of pay, Definitely knew he was going to be persecuted. He's going to have to struggle, stru uh, struggle, uh, struggle and suffer and sacrifice to start a church. Uh, but he was a blessing to them. He gave everything so a church would pop up. Souls could be saved from hell. Their lives could be changed. Now they turn around and do what a New Testament church ought to do. And that is not to forget the people that have helped you. And further, uh, to bless and help missionaries. They were certainly a missions-minded and missions-loving church. Notice verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have well done, Paul told the church at Philippi, that you did communicate with my affliction. That doesn't mean they talked to his pains or his sorrows. It means that word communicate means simply there that they were a partaker with him in his sufferings. They heard about them and they did something about it. Verse 15. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. He said, when I was there, started the church. When the gospel began, their soul started getting saved. Then when I went ahead and left, you knew it was going to be a struggle. I was in poverty, but nobody helped me but you guys. Amen. And so Paul certainly was encouraged by that. Verse 16, for even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. Then he says, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So what does this mean? Well, the first thing Paul expresses in verse 17 is a communication to the church concerning his motives. And what I want you to understand is simply this. He is rejoicing in that this church gave to his needs, but he did not want money or any other thing for money's sake. He was careful to communicate to them that he did not ever want them to think he was about money. The money was simply used to sustain him so that his mission could go on and he could preach the glorious gospel. And I will tell you what, I thank God for the purity of the Apostle Paul's heart and how God Amen. used him and gave inspired scriptures through his pen. You remember Paul received direct revelation from Jesus Christ as he was writing these epistles. Others had been with Christ. They recorded what they saw when they were with Christ. Others had heard what those that were with Christ had learned and then penned that down. But Paul took direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. I say he was a spirit-filled man of God. And when you're a spirit-filled person, man or woman, child or older person, and you, you will come to the place where all money is is just an avenue to get your life, to take care of your bills and to further the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you what. 
All this is is just pieces of paper to accomplish the perfect will of God. If money means anything more to you than that, like if you're falling in love with money, like all you can think about is money, and all you do is worry about is money, I'm telling you that God did not give us money for it to become a God, and Paul was not about to let it become a God. And all that being said, missions don't go forward without people giving to missions. Preachers can't not work a job because their job is to preach the gospel, win souls, and start churches without some kind of financial help. And so that's where Paul was at. This church, he helped them, and now they were helping him. Paul was not, as we call them, a money-grubbing evangelist. Amen? He was not, as we oftentimes call, lame missionaries who are not really doing the work of God. We call them vacationaries. Amen? And I wonder, I mean, if you're out there a missionary, and I'm going out knocking on doors, and we're winning souls, and we're putting banners up, and we're putting out more literature than ought to be legal, then you better be doing something also. We're not taking on people that are not going to be evangelistic. I thought it was awesome yesterday because we support the Marshall and my wife sent me some pictures and they're out there like 22 degrees or whatever it was and you know wonderfully freezing it was a high of 22 yesterday but I saw where they had to go they drove up these snowy mountain roads and they'd stop and there'd be one house way up on the hillside they'd have to walk up through the snowy driveway and then go up a couple flights of stairs to get to one house back down the stairs back in the vehicle drive another little way down through the mountains go to another house and I thought praise God for some people who are out there nobody cares about about those people in those mountains going to hell. Nobody's going to go drive up their driveways in the cold weather and knock on their doors except a biblical Baptist evangelist that's out there that we get a privilege to support. Amen. Amen. And there's people that are going to die and go to hell and nobody's ever going to care for their soul unless somebody takes them the gospel. It is a joy that we get to support that. It's not like, oh man, I'd have more money. I'm going to tell you what, I'd rather have blessings up in heaven and see souls saved and know I'm doing the will of God than have all the money in the world folks let's just face it uh let me move on i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna get off on i'll get off track here all right paul was not a money-grubbing evangelist as we've demonstrated many times there are money-grubbing evangelists everywhere that's another rabbit i'm not able to run this morning to be clear paul did receive their gift happily notice verse 18 he said but i have all in a bound i'm full having received of Epaphroditus. Now remember, they sent a church member and a godly missions-minded man to help Paul. So he said, I've received Epaphroditus, the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. I've got a sneaking suspicion somewhere in that care package uh, there may have been some food, amen, some non-perishables that were sent, praise God. I'm sure there were some letters personally handwritten from some of the people that love Paul. You know, as we get a missions barrel together, sometimes send a 55-gallon drum to another country or a container. Uh, you put all that stuff in there. So when the missionary opens it, you're just envisioning what a smile it's going to put on their face, what a blessing it's going to be uh, to this Man. missionary. So Paul, I believe an Aphrodite, Aphro Epaphroditus delivered the gift. He was overwhelmed and felt like he was full from their blessings. And notice what he said. I'm full having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent. It was a sweet smell. Now, Paul's heart didn't crave money, but I do want to show you today as the message what Paul did want uh, for them and what Paul's heart did desire for them. Number one, I want you to see this. Paul wanted to see God bless the members of the church and the whole body. Notice what he said. And I hope you'll learn something here today that maybe you don't fully understand. There's a tangibleness to this. you got to grasp this. Not because I desire a gift. He said, I didn't want you to give. The gift didn't bless me because I just love to open gifts. He said, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Now think about this, folks. Notice, first of all, the people in, in Philippi, they weren't like angelic. They weren't like superheroes. They weren't gods. They were just people like us, fallen people who had come to Christ and been saved by the grace of God. But they had accounts in heaven. Man. They had noticed what the scripture said again. He said, I don't desire just a gift. I desire a fruit that may abound to your account. Know this. You are not giving to benefit me if you give to this church. Okay? Mm -hmm. I don't take a penny at this point. Amen. And so that's not to give it. 
But uh, anyway, when, you, when I am able to be paid, as this church continues to grow and turn into an autonomous, uh, permanent church here in Homestead, that I believe will be here till Jesus comes in and win in souls for many, many years to come and be a lighthouse to many people, I want you to understand it's not for the preacher. You're not praying for missionaries to benefit me. You're not tithing. You're not supporting missions or any other thing to please any man. Notice this. If you hold your finger here, go to Matthew 6. I'm going to turn to a very familiar passage of Scripture. I want you to realize something. What you do down here for the Lord's work, it does not end here. And it does not just register here. But Paul said, you've got an account. Notice Matthew 6. Notice verse number 19. He said this. Matthew 6, verse number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Now wait a minute. First option is this. If you'd like to, you can live your whole life building bigger barns. Place to store all your junk, right? Just keep on accumulating goods and accumulating junk and you can be a hoarder. You can save gold, you can save silver, and you can build up your bank accounts and buy more cars and buy more land. But notice what he said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. This is the darling Lord Jesus telling you. And by the way, we've taught financial freedom, financial peace biblically right from the scriptures. It's great to have a savings. Right. It is wonderful to have an emergency fund. You ought right. to be saving for retirement. I get all that, but when you have enough, you better be convicted that you don't just save for the purpose of just being a rich fat cat while souls go to hell and you invest nothing in the work of God. Right. He says, lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. You ever notice when you buy a new car, it don't take long to get a nice scratch in it. The Lord just reminding you, don't put too much stock in goods. Don't put too much stock in your possessions. Amen. I had a friend, he was saving up, compiling cash in a safe, and had $46,000, and all of his precious uh, birthday gifts that his sons and daughters had given him over the years, all of that stolen out of a safe that was full of stuff. Now, I'm just saying, folks, that stuff is not going to last you. And even if you possess it and look upon it to your last dying day, not one ounce of it's going to go with you. You better be investing in the things that are eternal. You think I came down here because I want money? I could have went and made money in a lot of different places. My focus is not money, and you ought to be able to say the same thing with me today. And with the Apostle Paul, I don't just desire a gift. My life's not just about getting rich or getting money. You ought to have the same mindset as me. We are here for souls to be saved, and the glory goes to Almighty God. Amen. But there's also a bonus. I'm laying up treasures in another place. Right. He said, verse 20, but here's what we ought to do. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rough doth corrupt. It'll be there, praise God, when we get there. And where thieves do not break through nor steal. Watch verse 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And so listen, what Paul was saying is, I desire fruit to abound to your account. When you give to me, it's not for me. It's for amen. the Lord's work, amen. It's to sustain me as I preach the gospel. And in so doing, you're putting up stuff up in your heavenly bank account, amen. Digits are changing in the mind of God. The Lord knows everything that you're doing. If you're doing it for the right reason, for the glory of God, with dependence on the Holy Spirit of God, and you're truly supporting biblical missions. I don't want to get off on this rabbit for sure, but there is such a thing as non-biblical missions. I'll never forget time I was sitting in a church. I'll give you this quick. Family came in. The guy got up. He was a missionary to Hawaii. Okay, red flags, but okay. You're a missionary to Hawaii. Are Hawaiians going to hell? Absolutely. Are all people lost without God need churches? Absolutely. But I just want to listen very carefully when he said he's a missionary to Hawaii. Then he got up. After a little while, he, he said, yeah, we have a bookstore. That's our ministry. Wait a minute. I'm still looking for Paul starting bookstores. I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm still looking here where Jesus said, upon this rock, I'll build my bookstore. Come on. Amen? Amen? And then he said, and I almost fell out of my seat because my brother and I were plastering a 30,000 uh, person city every
every week knocking on every single door and trying to completely fill the whole town with the doctor of the church. Out of 500 people, my brother and I was the only one soul winning at the time. It was absolutely ridiculous. Ended up leaving that church not long after that. But anyway, he got up and said, it's nice. He said about six months ago, I even got to share a gospel track with one of our customers. Well, bless your heart. We're sending you $250 a month so you can preach the gospel. And you're over there living high on the hog and enjoying Hawaii. And in six months, you gave out one. I give out more than that on accident in a day. Amen. I probably drop one out of my vehicle. And this guy intentionally gives out in six months. I'm saying, folks, there's a lot of deadbeats out there. And they're milking the churches and they're criminals. We need to make sure. By the way, my wife's checking out what's going on out there. She's not my agent. But I'm just saying, we make sure that who we're supporting is actually there preaching the gospel. And I get a chance to go and check it out. I'll take you people with me. We'll go see it. Amen? And so anyway, Paul wanted uh, them to get fruit in their account. So as we invest in God's kingdom down here, every penny of that, every bit of effort transfers directly into our account in heaven. We do not labor in vain. Amen? Uh, so, uh, and the eternal investments we make secure rich dividends. By the way, notice verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So understand this, folks. Uh, as you invest down here, you get a dividend. I understand right now it's, it's you're probably better just get a checking account than a savings account because you're not going to earn any interest at all. But as you invest in heaven, in the heavenly things, you certainly get great dividends. So not only did Paul want the Philippians blessed over in glory, he knew they would be blessed right here today. At the same time, we're laying up treasures in heaven. Our giving will instigate God's blessings in this life. I'm going to tell you what, I enjoy God's blessings, don't you? Amen. 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 I enjoy just doing what I know to do, asking God to help me to know the rest I'm supposed to do, living a clean, pure life, and enjoying the blessings of God. Man, if you're not blessed by God, if you can't see and feel and sense His blessings on you, then you need to get under the spout where the glory comes out and start doing what is required to receive the blessings. Amen. Luke 6.38 is one of my favorite scriptures. It says this, and I love this. This is the economy of God. Here's the dividends. You say, well, I don't see where you get dividends and you know what you do is actually multiply. Well, how about this? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give in to your bosom. For with the same measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Let me just, it's, it's kind of like this. Do you ever go to the beach and maybe you're playing with a little one and they've got a little old cup and, and they're putting sand in and, and doing all of that. Then dad comes in and he's got the big old bucket, you know, from Dollar General and he fills his big bucket up. Here's what you are. In reference to God and giving, you got a little old thing, and you're just pouring out the little bit that you've got, and God comes back with the big old bucket. Amen? And uh, I saw a funny thing. It was Elon Musk landed on Mars or something like that. He looked over, and there was a dollar general sitting already. Amen? But anyway, but that's how it is. God has a massive bucket and pours it out. You give. God said, I'll give it back to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. Men will give into your bosom. So I'm given to get blessed up there. I'm given to get blessed down here. But primarily I'm given because I love Jesus. I want to be obedient. I want to see souls saved and lives changed. So God's promise of supplying all your need is in this context of us giving to fulfill the Great Commission. So if you don't think God's supplying all your need. So preacher, I just don't uh, think God's supplying all my need. You might want to examine whether you have a heart of giving or a heart of covetousness. And a lot of times, let's just be honest. I've got part of each. I have to battle covetousness, and so do you. Man. You want to sit here and say, I never covet, you're a liar today. Man. All of us struggle at times with giving, okay? When people struggle financially, I often see a direct correlation to the fact that they don't invest their money in missions, nor do they invest their time in evangelism. And by the way, time is a precious economy as well that all of us must invest. And I have to almost, I feel almost like I have to apologize to the men, especially Brother Zach. Brother Zach was here on Tuesday for Institute, uh, or Wednesday for Institute, and then we had uh, Thursday church, and then we had Friday night we went soul with him and passed out literature, and then Saturday night we had men's meeting. He's here in church all day again today, and I never want to wear you guys out. And I'm, by the way, I have to apologize for a second thing. The other night I said, I thank God for you hardworking men. 
And I didn't come drag it in. Then I looked over at poor Miss Sandy, and I thought, I just blew that one. I, I thank God, by the way, for you, Miss Rosemary, Miss Claudia, all you hardworking ladies that I did mention, uh, that you work and still you come to church tired. I realize that's difficult. I know that takes dedication and commitment, but it is a real blessing. So we ought to be investing in the work of God. But Paul didn't want money for his own. He wanted to see his friends blessed by God with eternal and temporal benefits. But secondly, Paul wanted to see God pleased and glorified. Look at verse 18. He said, But I am I have all and abound on full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Watch this, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. So he wanted them blessed. Amen? Amen. Hey, keep giving to our mission. You're going to get blessed here. You're going to get blessed over there. But also, he wanted to see God pleased and glorified. It's right Amen. here in the text. Notice first that God is glorified by our gifts as they are considered sacrifices to him. Look at verse 18. He said, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. Now, we're a New Testament priesthood. We're to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. We don't bring animals. I didn't see anybody coming in with blood on their shoes. I'm sure you're not killing goats at the house or any of that. No, we offer spiritual sacrifices. It costs us something, but we give it to the Lord as He has given to us His Son as our sacrifice. And I've often mentioned that the reason I encourage people to come forward and put their money in the box or basket in that, in that type of a setting is because I want to remind them that our giving is considered a part of our worship to God. Amen? Now, again, if, if you give to a ministry of our church online, that's logistically works better for you. I just want you to remember that there ought to be a heart of sacrifice always behind that hand of giving. This verse indicates to us further that our missions offerings are sacrifices that please God. Watch this. As they smell sweet, they are a fragrant scent in his nostrils. Now, how many have ever, you men, I, I guess I could get you men in a lot of trouble. I don't want to be the cause of a divorce. But uh, how many ladies know what it's like uh, to get roses? What's the first thing you do? Amen. When somebody sacrifices and gives you uh, a bouquet of roses, Every Mother's Day, my mother's in a nursing home up in Pennsylvania. We don't spare any expense. We always get her a really nice bouquet because we always want her to say, man, those are beautiful flowers and they smell so great and they really make the room uh, smell nice and everything. Well, I want you to understand that when we give to missions, when we support missionaries and our heart is the very heart of God to see people saved from hell, that becomes a sweet sacrifice to God that smells sweet in his nostrils when he Amen. sees us doing that. I'm going to tell you what. It's not my flashy preaching or how good you look in church or how big a King James Bible you carry that impresses God. I'm going to tell you what really moves the heart of God. And he says, smells good in my nostrils. It's when we say, wait, there's other people going to hell that you died for. We want to be a part in sending men there and women to go with them to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what we want to invest in. And when we do invest in that, it smells sweet in his nostrils. Look at verse 18. He said it's an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So as you smell roses and get pleasure from that, God sees us supporting missions, having a church planting mindset, which by the way, those that claim to be Baptists and are not interested in planting churches, they're no more Baptists than there's a man in the moon. Baptists by our very nature plant churches. That's what we do. We fulfill the Great Commission. That was the last words of our Lord. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Tear it until you're endued with power from on high. Then go forth and tell the whole world, this is the heartbeat of God. Now, I love lavender. How many like lavender? How many have essential oils? You've got a diffuser. Or I, I, Growing up as a kid, you know, they used to have this stuff. It really, I don't know, you can't find it no more. Either that or my, my nasals just don't work anymore. But my mom used to use that lavender, uh, what do you call that? Not detergent, but the softener. See, I know really a whole lot about, you can tell my clothes are still dirty sitting in a basket waiting on my wife, amen? But uh, I do plan on doing a load or two before she comes. She's going to have to walk me through it on Facebook, but anyway, uh, FaceTime. <clears throat> but I love that uh, that smell of lavender. Amen? Doesn't that smell great? And I love sandalwood. Essential oil sandalwood. I'm, the only, I'm probably the only crazy one that loves the smell of sandalwood. But I really flip over patchouli. Is there anyone here that knows what patchouli smells like? 
All, all right, one guy. We're gonna have to really have to get educated on this, all right? How many of you have some favorite scents? I mean, maybe, I used to literally work with this lady. She was a former nun, which is something good not to be anymore, amen, a Catholic nun. And uh, she worked with me in a mental home back when I was way back in Bible college days. And uh, she used to bring in a little thing of Play-Doh. About halfway through her shift, she'd pull this little jar. She's about 65 years old. And she'd smell it a few times. And she'd put the cap on and just say, I've always loved the smell of Play-Doh. She'd put it back in her little satchel. And she always had a friend. I thought it was kind of crazy, but I get it. Amen. I get it. I understand what she was doing. Amen. And I'm sure that some of you have some smells that you think sweeten up your life. You know what sweetens up the Lord's life? You know what makes him happy? You know what he says? That's what I like to smell. When he looks down upon his people and we're not just playing church, we're not just going to be here, you know, whether we, whether we want to be here or not, tip God five bucks, endure the message, and leave in a huff. No, when he looks down and sees his people and we understand it, we get it. This book is all about keeping people out of hell and giving God glory. It's about his great commission. When we get that and we're engaged in that and we're focused on that and our vision is going to continue to be that, that is the sweet smell that God enjoys so much. Amen. So every time I write down my missions amount, it's like, there you go, Lord. Amen. 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 When we give to missions, it's a sweet smell. As we examine verses 20 through 23, I want you to ponder three things with me. Vision, value, and victory. You're going to forget those, so let me give you them one by one. Number one, I want you to notice in verse number 20, Paul helps them now to refocus their vision. As he's drawing this letter to a close, he wants to remind them of something that is of utmost importance. Notice, if you would, verse 20. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now why say that? <clears throat> well, this is the supreme goal of man. This is why we exist, to glorify Him. Secondly, he knows that the tendency of churches and men and women is to bring glory to ourselves. This ain't Ted Alexander's church. This is the Lord's church in Homestead, uh, Florida. Amen? Man, right. This is not, well, uh, you need to, have you ever been down to, to, to Pastor Alexander's church? I hate when people say that. Amen? I hate when people get up and testify and say, Pastor Alexander saved me. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Amen? Right. I'm just a vessel. God saves through His Word and through His Spirit. He died on the cross, yeah. not me. Don't ever glorify me. I honestly, I get uncomfortable even when we have our pie and praise. And my wife said to me the other night, she said, some way we got to try to steer that away from everybody thanking us. And I said, I, we try, honey. But I, and I get there's appreciation and thank God for that. But listen, Paul wanted this Philippian church as he finished the letter. So let me tell you one final thing. To God be all the glory for all he's done in your church. Every one of you that's saved. Every family member that's going to get saved. You helping me in my mission. To God be all the glory for that. Uh, by the way, if you walk through these doors for any other reason today than to, to God be the glory, you walked in for the wrong reason. He deserves our worship. He deserves our praise. We're here to exalt Him. Let Him speak through His Word. Let His Spirit work in our hearts. Us submit to Him and learn Him and please Him. This is what Christianity is all about. Amen. So Paul helps him refocus their vision. He draws his letter to a close. He leads both the initial hearers and by extension all of us through the centuries back to the true ultimate focus of it all to the glory of God. Amen. He's reminding them. This is why I started the church in Philippi, for the glory of God. This is why I ended up in jail. I was out there preaching for the glory of God. This is why he continued to preach, to bring God glory. This is why Epaphroditus was sent, for the glory of God. This is why they should rejoice, for the glory of God. This is why they should think on good, wholesome things, as he taught them, for the glory of God. This is why they should give the missions, for the glory of God. This, the truth is the why of Christianity. It's the who of Christianity. It's the what of Christianity. It's the when and the where. It all boils down to when it's done. Did we glorify the saint? Amen. Amen. That's why we're here. For Amen. his good pleasure, we are and were created. Right. Every person, every Christian, every penny, every prayer, every thought, every deed, everything exists and is done so that God might get glory forever. And again, if you esteem this a light thing, you're not going to like eternity. 
Because he fixed up eternity for the angel choirs to lead us as we fall down prostrate at his feet and worship amen. him. Praise God. Did I say prostate? That's normal for me. Amen. You understand? I'll just put it this way. On your belly. Amen. amen. It's like my wife's daddy. He's a mechanic. He was preaching along one time and said, God will remove your transmissions. Amen. amen. And he might. I don't know. Uh, he might replace it. Help you out that way. But you know what? This means now and later. We live for the glory of God. Amen. See, that's a purpose for living. Amen. Not the drugging, not the drinking, not the carousing, not all the sexual promiscuity, not to exalt yourself. I have a goal. I have a purpose in life. I want to glorify my Savior. Amen. So Paul gives them vision. Then secondly, he ascribes to them value. And I think this is really important. And I hope I don't sound contradictory as to what I said concerning my wife and I and our pie and praise. But it is good to recognize and let people know, I care for you. Amen. Not in a weird way, not in, a, in an inappropriate way, but we ought to be able to express our love and our kindness one to another. It's very important. And we're not trying to create a setting or an aura in our church, but I will tell you this, if all of us submit our hearts to God, it'll just happen that you can sense the Spirit of God when you walk in the door. Amen. And I'm praying for that day, that when people come in, they'll be able to say, those people love God. That preacher preaches the book. Those people care for me. They welcomed me. They loved on me. That's what we're trying to, to have. And that only comes as we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. But we also have to learn to value people. Amen. To love people. You may be the only person that said something nice to another person in the last seven days. There may be people going through deep, deep waters. And you're doing fine. You know nothing about it. You can't even relate to it. But if you'll express some kindness, you have no idea how far that can go in someone's life. Amen. Paul wanted every member of the church to get a kind greeting from him. You know, it starts with that. Don't walk in the church. What's that all about, man? I ain't done nothing to you. What are you mad at me for? Amen? Walk in. Put your hand up. Somebody shook my hand the other day, and I don't even remember who it was, so I can't pick on one of these guys, but it was a little soft. Amen? Put a firm handshake out. You know, like Brother Baxter said, not the death grip. I'm trying out for MMA. <laughs> not that one. But look a man in the eye, shake his hand, and say, it's good to see you, brother. By the way, uh, you know, it's okay to give a hug. Amen? Now, don't pull my whole body in. Amen? A couple pats on the back. That's fine. Praise God. Uh, don't do like Brother Foles does it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Your brother folds, if you're not careful, you get a kiss on the forehead with him, amen? And if he does that, you slap him, that's on you, amen? But in all seriousness, it starts with us greeting one another, coming up and letting each other know, hey, everything's okay between us. I'm not mad at you because the devil loves to say, they didn't shake your hand because they don't, they don't think you're, you're, you're good or whatever the case is. So this was basically Paul saying hello. Look at verse 21, 22. He says, close in the letter now, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you chiefly. They that are of Caesar's household. So I wanted everybody to get a hello. And uh, this let them individually know Paul was thinking about them. Amen. Paul lets them know that everyone in his company was also sending a smile and a hello their way. This was letting the church in Philippi know, hey, you're not alone. We stand with you. Where we're at, we're standing with you. Amen. We may not see you, and I may never see you again, but where you're standing with Jesus and loving him, we're standing here loving him, and we're with you. Amen? We're all on the same team. Paul was expressing to them that he valued them enough to think about them and to acknowledge them. There's, there's an interesting phrase in verse 23 uh, or 22 that I want to point out. He said, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. Now think for just a moment with me. We see that a number, obviously, of the emperor's servants had gotten saved. This is, this is interesting to me. Paul gets thrown in jail, and he goes about now to start a church in prison. Amen? Right. And he's got one pretty well going here. Now, how organized it was, I can't tell, but there are some souls saved here as Paul's in jail. It's pintiful. Paul can see more saved in jail means he's outside of jail. Amen? Right. I'm just saying, we're not doing something right here. Amen? But notice they're both called saints and those that are of Caesar's household. 
So look, these are people who were working there in the palace. They were under the thumb of Caesar. They had gotten around Paul, and it was infectious, man. It was contagious. Man. They saw his spirit, and God worked, and they got saved by the grace of God. Man. So the only viable conclusion of these things is, well, Paul must have won many to Christ while he was there in the prison. These Italian people who were not only saved, which I've got Italian roots. My mother's a Polak, my dad was an Italian, so uh, I, I always look, like looking back and seeing Italians getting saved pretty early, amen. amen. But uh, these people were not only saved, they also knew Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. Now get this, Paul's in jail. All the workers that are supposed to be keeping an eye on him, running things in the palace, they bring him pens, they're facilitating him, they're helping him to get the things that he needs to write a letter to Philippi. And yeah. now they know that he's finishing his letter. They must have some good fellowship. Amen. I'm wondering how difficult it actually was on Paul here at times when I read about some of this. But uh, listen, uh, they must have been in close fellowship with Paul. It's interesting how that in the midst of trials, God will send you some angels sometimes. And then he'll also send you some people sometimes. Amen. If you're discouraged, maybe God's wanting to send you a person open up to that. If you're depressed... Somebody wants to lend you a helping hand or be a friend to you or say an encouraging word, open up to that. You know, you got to be open for people to be able to help you too. You can't cut everybody off and say, well, nobody's here to help me. Well, why don't you open your heart to it? Why don't you let somebody love you? Why don't you let somebody be kind to you? These converts of Paul, they wanted to express their love to the Philippian church as well. This is interesting to me. Notice what he says here in verse 22. All the saints salute you. They chiefly that are of Caesar's household. So here's what they said. Paul, before you finish that letter, could you tell them how that we got saved? And could you let them know that we're praying for them also? Can you tell them we said hi to? Uh, because we now heard the gospel. We know they're struggling. Let them know, Paul. That, that, that's just an amazing thing as you think about what was going on during this imprisonment. Amazing stuff, amen. And in reference to Paul describing value to the Philippians, just imagine this. The letter now finally arrives there at the church at Philippi. And all of a sudden it's being read. And Paul says, salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren that are with me greet you. I'm sure there were some people there that said, wow, he's thinking about us. Paul remembers us. Man, we miss him and we'd love to see his face. And boy, we hope he comes and sees us. But thank God he said hello to us. Amen. That must have been a real blessing to the people that were there at Philippi. By the way, the devil likes to constantly tell you you're of no value. Amen. And Paul wanted the Philippians to know, hey, you have value. Amen. You matter. And I want you to know that I love you and I say hello. And all of those that are here are saluting you. So Paul refocuses their vision. He reassures them of their value. And then lastly, he reminds them of the victory of the believer through grace. He closes this glorious letter in verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. You know, it's grace that we need at the point of salvation. And it's grace that we have. That's our victory at the point of salvation. God's riches through Christ's expense. If you want the biblical definition of grace, it is his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. That is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 uh, through 8 there. Uh, but listen, Ephesians 1, 6 says, To the praise of the glory of his grace. To the praise of the glory of God's grace. God's grace is so amazing that it has a glory. And there's praise that is ascribed even to the gloriousness of God's grace. Man. That he ever thought about you and I is grace. And there is glory to be ascribed to that. Just the graciousness that God had. We could have all been in hell with gasoline britches on. There's no reason in the world that you deserve salvation. You and I could never merit it. But where all of us were in different places at different times, the Spirit of God came and dealt with us and drew us and convicted us. How? All by the grace of Almighty God. It was a Amen. gift that He came and brought us salvation. Amen. We must also realize every victory in the Christian life, not just at salvation, but throughout our life, it's enabled and empowered and made possible purely by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever you hit a victory in your Christian life, I, I, my wife and I right now are looking forward to the day whenever that may come when this church is officially organized. 
we become autonomous under God and cut the ties of our sending church. And, and, and we look at different dates. We've looked at the dates when our daughters would get married and things of that nature. But I'm just saying it's an awesome, awesome thing uh, to look and recognize that was all by the grace of God when you look back at it. Amen? Second Corinthians 12, 9. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my affirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. His grace is sufficient for our lives. Amen. So Paul kindly prays for an impartation of that grace upon the Philippians in his final thoughts and in his final words. Now we're closing this letter. Give me a few more minutes and I'll have you out of here. I want to draw everything to a close by considering some of the major lessons we learned from this letter. How about let's go back to the beginning if you were here or if you weren't. Paul went into this place because he had a Macedonian call. There was a call that came to Paul's life, and this church would not have ever even existed. Most likely, all those souls would have died and gone to hell had Paul not taken heed to the call upon his life to go and share the gospel. Y'all look up here at me. God has a calling or a plan or a purpose for every single life in this building. And all that we would ever ask as a preacher, and you want to bless your preacher, you want to give glory to God, find out what the perfect will of God is for your life and do it with all of your heart. Amen. That's what success is. If you looked up biblical success, amen, you would see, find God's will and do it for the glory of God. That is truly what a successful life looks, at, looks like. Amen. And so Paul listened to the call, and I've got a sneaking suspicion, over the years, God's going to call some men out of this church. I believe we're going to see men stand up with tears running down their face saying, Preacher, I've got another church. God called me to preach. I don't know if they'll say it exactly like that. Amen? <laughs> but I've been in enough of those gully washer services where I've seen, I was in a service in Indiana myself, I'll tell you, seven young men walked an aisle. We had about 200 youth in there. And seven young men came and went to altar for about 45 minutes, got called to preach. And several of them are in ministry right now. Others are still training for the ministry. I'm just saying, folks, that is a glorious, glorious Man. thing. But Man. Paul had to submit when God called. Just do what God wants Man. you to do. Man. Secondly, planting churches is a great spiritual battle with many trials. We see Paul get thrown in jail there. We went to the book of Acts and we looked at Acts chapter 16. Talked about how that was in jail in Philippi. Now he's in jail writing a letter to Philippi. I think it's safe to say as we try to plant churches, guess what? There's going to be a lot of trials. You can go join an easy church. You can do that. You can sit in the pew. they got lots of money in the bank and a beautiful air-conditioned building and everything's all plush. And Man, that's wonderful. I'd rather be in the battle starting New Testament churches, scriptural right. evangelistic churches. Right. But I'm telling you, folks, there's a lot of trials that comes with it. Look at like Paul's life. Paul was insane. Serve God. It's a bowl of cherries. It was with much trials and tribulations that we pressed toward the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Church planning is not to be entered upon lightly. The devil will attack us with apostasy, wolves, oppression, depression, divisions, you name it. Amen. Third lesson from this book, supporting godly church planners in their mission is cutting-edge biblical Christianity. Amen. If we're not supporting missionaries, what world are we here for? Amen. If we're not trying to get the word out so people are kept out of hell, don't tell me you believe in hell and yet you won't support missions. Amen. Man, hell's a horrible place. How horrible is it? Is it horrible on us for us to tell our neighbors about Jesus? Is it horrible enough for us to give to missions to support and send out missions to continue to start New Testament churches? And then let me throw this out. Fourthly, the love between a church planner and the church people is like no other. It is uniquely precious. I'll remind you of Philippians 1, 1 through 9. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. Always in every prayer. You might forget the introduction, but man, this was the setting of the whole letter. A broken heart and love for these people. Always in every prayer of mine for you. Always all making mention or making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel uh, from the first day until now. Being confident in this very thing that he which hath begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Jesus. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, y'all are partakers of my grace. 
For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. What I'm saying is, folks, the love between a church planter and the people is a love like no other. Paul said in my deepest inward parts, I yearn for you. I love you. I want to see your face. I want to see you blessed. Can I tell you, Christianity can be so beautiful when you're submitted to God. The love that we experience and the kindness and the joy and the familia that we have well beyond flesh and blood, much deeper than flesh and blood, much sweeter. I'm closer to my Christian brothers and sisters in most cases than almost everyone that I'm flesh blood related to. There's uh, something amazing about being together. My friend, heaven bound with the hammer down. We're all on the same team, pressing toward the same goal. The love of Christ in our churches can be beautiful. Amen. Paul had such a deep love. I'll tell you, I strive for that. I want to be a loving person. I pray that you will as well as he desired that for them. The fifth and final lesson from this book is this. All we do is for God and only and always it's by his grace and for his glory. Amen. That's why we're here today, folks. We are commemorating that Christ both died and was buried and then how did he rose again in fulfillment of the scriptures to pay our sin debt. We're here to glorify the Father because of what he's done in offering us salvation. So in closing, if I may officially enter into the record of our lives and submit for your further consideration the letter from the Apostle Paul to the Philippians, and my prayer really is that the truths that we saw in this book will continue to change our lives and conform us to the image of Christ. If we go back and learn those five lessons, it'd be life-changing. Amen? Father, 